All right, good evening, everybody. Dr. Kenneth McQuaid, uh, the past president of the ASGE. Uh, and on behalf of Kathleen Shellett from the SGNA and Edward Lee, uh, it's our pleasure to welcome you to tonight's uh, webinar on Biosimilars, a new era of gastroenterology management considerations. This is actually a two-part series, and in part one this evening, we will be going over the fundamentals. I believe there's some housekeeping uh, slides we're going to go over first, which talk about this as a CM activity, and then we'll get actually into our webinar. So this is a CME activity. Uh, uh, offered both through the SGNA uh, and the ASGE, uh, for which you will get uh, credit if you are properly registered and have attended the entire program and go through the uh, complete evaluation tool. Uh, I would say that this has also been supported uh, by an unrestricted grant from uh, Pfizer uh, Incorporated. However, all the planning, the implementation, the evaluation, and the record keeping for this activity uh, has been uh, conducted solely uh, uh, through uh, the uh, a provider uh, without any influence uh, from the commercial entity sponsoring this program. Uh, neither uh, myself uh, nor Kathleen Shelnut or Catherine Bauer, who is also involved with the planning of this, uh, have uh, any uh, uh, financial relationships uh, to disclose related to this activity. Dr. Edward Lee, the uh, Pharma D uh, involved with this, is a consultant for Pfizer and has received honorary in the past from Hospira and Pfizer. So these are learning objectives for this evening's uh, uh, webinar. I'd like to talk about biosimilars, what they are, uh, and how they really compare to generic compounds, how they're different. Uh, we would talk, like to talk about uh, how the FDA goes through the approval process for those and how it looks at the totality of the evidence to determine whether a compound is truly biosimilar or not. We're gonna talk about some of the safety and immunogenicity data uh, of the originator biologics and the biosimilars. We're gonna talk about the relevant regulations concerning uh, whether pharmacies can substitute a biosimilar compound for the originator compound. We'll also talk about the role of the nurse in the process of the biosimilar use. As we know, the nurses talk regularly to the patients uh, in the clinics, in the endoscopy unit, in the infusion centers, and are going to be given a lot of the questions from the patients. We want the nurses to be comfortable uh, with what biosimilars are and are not. And ultimately, therefore, we're going to review the key concepts uh, re related to patient teaching uh, on biosimilars, because as we're going to see, there are a lot of questions out there from patients, from nurses, uh, from uh, pharmacists, from physicians as to what biosimilars are. To uh, uh, keep this uh, going this evening, we're going to keep it interactive. Uh, Dr. Lee uh, and uh, Kathleen uh, Shelnut and I are going to be uh, uh, talking back and forth with one another. Uh, we would like you all listening as well to use the uh, uh, Q&A uh, opportunities to send us questions, and we'll try and answer those uh, throughout the evening. Uh, at the end, this is a one-hour session. I think we have sufficient time to get through the roughly 38 slides or so and hopefully answer your questions so that at the end of this activity, you're comfortable uh, with biosimilars and what uh, this whole uh, 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 sort of a controversy is all about. So let's begin tonight's webinar uh, with a uh, case scenario of a 27-year-old woman who was recently diagnosed with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. She was initially treated with uh, oral mesalamine uh, and then given additionally prednisone orally without improvement, and ultimately mesalamine enemas were added as well, but simply hasn't gotten better. And so after discussion, the decision's made to start her on an anti-TNF agent, in this case, uh, IV infliximab. Now, typically, uh, uh, when we prescribed infliximab in the past, we've used what I will refer to as the reference product or the originator product, a Remicade. However, uh, now on the market, are some biosimilar infliximab compounds, uh, Inflectra, which is infliximab DYYB, and we'll talk about what these initials mean in just a second, and Renflexis, which is infliximab ABDA. Now, the patient has a lot of questions. 
She's gone in for her infusion uh, and actually has been uh, told that potentially she could be given a biosimilar compound rather than the originator compound that has been on the market for a long time, in this case, Remicade. And she wants to know what this means. What exactly does biosimilar mean? How biosimilar is it to the originator compound? How are they made? And how does that manufacturing process different from the uh, uh, originator compound? How do we know that these compounds are as safe and as effective as the originator compound? Will it be administered similarly? Will it be given in the same setting? Is it the same kind of infusion? Uh, really, is it the same as the originator? And ultimately, she's going to want to know what the process for approval of these agents is. She knows about the FDA, but really, what has the FDA gone through? Uh, what has the, uh, these biosimilar companies gone through to demonstrate to the FDA and ultimately to us as consumers and the prescriber of these agents that these compounds are safe and uh, as effective as the originator compounds? Joe also wants to know if she takes this compound, what happens if it doesn't work? Will she be switched to the originator compound? Will she be given a different compound? What will happen? And she would like to know just why is it that her insurance company may want to give her the biosimilar compound rather than the originator compound? Is it better? Is it the same? Is it cheaper? You know, what is the reason for uh, prescribing this biosimilar compound or administering this rather than the originator compound? These are the questions uh, you as physicians may be asked to answer. These are the questions the pharmacists may be asked, asked to answer. And the nurses uh, will certainly be asked these by the patients talking to them. And the question is, can you answer her questions? And we're hoping by the end of this evening that you will be able to answer these questions and confidently understand the difference uh, between biosimilars and generics and uh, between biosimilar drugs and the uh, originator uh, or, uh, compounds. So let's start with the first question. What is a biosimilar? This is the FDA definition. Uh, it's on their website. A biosimilar is a biological product that's highly similar, though not identical, to a U.S. licensed reference biological product for which there are no clinically meaningful differences in safety, purity, or potency of the product. So it's highly similar no clinically meaningful differences in safety, purity, or potency of the product. And what we'll talk about this evening is, how do we know that? How do we know when we give this to our patients that it's as safe, as pure, uh, and no difference in potency to the originator products? So is it better than the originator compounds? No, it's not better. It's similar. Is it a Me Too biologic? Well, not really. Unlike generic compounds, which are identical, these are not necessarily identical in terms of their structure, uh, but they're biosimilar. This is a list of the currently approved biosimilars in the United States, and we're going to see more coming along in the years to come, uh, because as we know, uh, these drugs um, are uh, proliferating in the marketplace. We're seeing more and more biological compounds. And as they uh, go out longer and longer, they uh, reach the end of their uh, 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 patent. Uh, and now uh, the FDA has developed a process by which biosimilars can come on the market. And what we'll see here is that uh, for the, in the IBD space, which is what we're talking about this evening, where we have had uh, two major biologics that have been out for some time now, Remicade and Humira, uh, there are biosimilar compounds coming along. In the case of Remicade, there are now two biosimilar compounds, Inflectra and Rinflexis. And in the case of uh, Humira, there is uh, uh, one compound on the market uh, called uh, Speltizo. There's other biologics out there that also have uh, biosimilar compounds that have come out. And as we'll see, when we look at uh, the, uh, whether it's the infliximab or adalimumab, that uh, in the IBD space, they are, uh, uh, have indications for both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, as well as the other rheumatologic disorders uh, for which the originator compounds had approval. Their naming is interesting uh, because uh, the 
Generic name for the compounds we're discussing this evening is infliximab and adalimumab. Once you have the biosimilars come out, they would theoretically have the same generic name, which could lead to confusion uh, among pharmacists uh, and physicians and nurses and patients as to what compound they're actually getting. And so in order to give more uh, vigilance to this process, in order to uh, avoid inadvertent sub substitution, the FDA has decided to apply uh, to these compounds uh, four letters to the end of the name, uh, which are nonsense letters, but are, uh, indicate the different um, um, biosimilar uh, compound uh, that's out there. Uh, and so in the case of the infliximab, the two compounds that are out now are DYYB and ABDA, and in case of adalimumab, it's ATTO. So going forward, all these compounds, all new uh, biosimilars will have these four letters applied. These will be in the uh, uh, electronic uh, healthcare systems, uh, and uh, uh, it uh, uh, reduces the perception uh, when looking at these drugs uh, that the biosimilar is inferior to the reference product, but in my mind, the major, main thing it does is uh, uh, prevents inadvertent substitution by identifying the different compounds. Well, the patient asks at the end, why is it that uh, the her formulary plan may want to substitute a biosimilar for the originator compound? It's not, and it's, it's not better than the original compound. Why is it that they therefore would want to use it? and it really comes down to cost. Uh, we could anticipate, just as when we talk about generic drugs, uh, which are different from biosimilars, but we're all comfortable with using generic drugs, and we understand that when generic drugs come onto the marketplace, they often, though not always, lead to a reduction in drug costs. And the same is anticipated with the biosimilar compounds. This is looking at, um, uh, over the next uh, the three years, from 2017 to 2020, what the estimated savings are uh, to the uh, um, healthcare marketplace, uh, looking at eight different uh, sort of key biologics, according to whether uh, the uh, uh, cost is reduced by uh, 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 anywhere from 20%, uh, 30%, or 40%, as shown by the three different colored bars. And depending on where that reduction in cost ends up, the savings in the, in the healthcare marketplace will be somewhere between 55 to $109 billion, which is, of course, an enormous amount of money. And provided these drugs are equally safe and efficacious, uh, that savings uh, is very important uh, to us as healthcare consumers and something we should all uh, support. But the real question that we will address this evening is how do we know that they are equally safe and efficacious? That's what has uh, patients concerned. Uh, that's what has uh, uh, physicians concerned. Uh, and we need to understand uh, what the companies have gone through, uh, what the FDA has demanded uh, to really uh, be confident that these uh, biosimilars are equally safe and efficacious to the originator compounds. Now, uh, when we look at these uh, biosimilar drugs, we're talking about they are, they are biological compounds. And in the cases of infliximab and anilimumab, they are antibodies, which are uh, proteins uh, with complex three-dimensional structures. Uh, they may be uh, glycosylated. Uh, they may have um, other, uh, 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 they may be pegylated. There may be other things that are, are attached to them that uh, make them very, very complex uh, structures. And uh, that's different from a chemical drug, a drug like aspirin or the antihypertensives we use or the cholesterol reducing agents we use, which are small, generally low molecular weight compounds that are simple and well defined. Chemical drugs can be made um, uh, uh, in reproducible chemical reactions that are, and the copies that are made are identical from one to the next to the next. And so when we look at the generic process for producing chemical drugs, uh, we can have reasonable confidence that when one company or another company makes a generic drug of a chemical drug, these uh, will be identical in nature. And there are the major concerns will be the purity of the drug, the uh, uh, sort of bioavailability of the drug, but the drug itself 
uh, is identical in the generic space uh, for these chemical drugs. In the case of the biologic drugs, again, these are large, high molecular weight uh, proteins. They are complex, they are heterogeneous, and they are produced in living cells or organisms. Uh, typically, uh, um, uh, cells that are in culture, uh, such as uh, 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 mouse cells, that uh, will produce these proteins uh, into the culture medium. Uh, the proteins that are made um, will have to be uh, then purified, uh, ultimately uh, put into a, a solution uh, with things to stabilize the compound. Uh, and um, uh, 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 they can be, depending on the, uh, uh, the, the proteins, they can be uh, fairly unstable and sensitive to the external conditions, such as the pH and the temperature. And so it stands to reason that this is a, uh, a complex process producing these biologic agents. It's not like a chemical drugs. These are uh, much more uh, difficult to produce. And there can be variability of the molecular structure, even within a particular lot, um, but definitely between lots within the same company. Uh, and when it comes to producing biosimilar compounds, uh, it's uh, stands to reason that it may be impossible to produce compounds of identical in nature. Uh, the goal is to have them be highly biosimilar and not to have any significant differences in their immunogenicity uh, or their uh, clinical efficacy. Uh, but it's, it's important to emphasize that, again, the biosimilar compounds are biologics, and uh, their, their process for producing them is very complex, very different from uh, generics and chemical drugs. So uh, I'd like to switch over to Ed at this point, our PharmD, who can talk to us about how biosimilars are different from uh, generics uh, and how uh, the approval process uh, for the FDA uh, is different when we talk about biosimilar compounds going through the PHSA uh, sort of uh, process uh, versus uh, the generic approval process which goes through the FDA's FDCA process. So, Ed, let me turn it over to you. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. And um, I'm glad to be here talking to everybody to tonight about biosimilars. And, uh, you know, you, you set everything up perfectly for me uh, for this slide to talk about why there would be kind of these differences in the regulatory approval process uh, between um, a, bio, a biological product or biosimilars and kind of generics. And so because the small molecule drugs are uh, small and uh, you can characterize them uh, completely, you know what the chemical structure is, uh, they, um, th there's a different process for approving that than for biologics, with, which have, you know, that, uh, again, that more complex manufacturing associated with it. So small molecule drugs, uh, originally that's um, the pathway that allowed small molecule drugs to be marketed in the United States is the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, uh, and uh, new drug applications, the NDA pathway. Uh, is the pathway to get brand new molecules onto market, uh, and uh, that would require uh, what we call a full report of safety and efficacy. So typically those uh, two randomized phase three controlled trials uh, that demonstrate that the product is safe and effective, right? So uh, when a generic comes out now, that's an abbreviated process, right? We call that an abbreviated new drug application process. And what that means is that we're extending the conclusions uh, that the molecule itself is safe and effective. And so a company now that wants to uh, make that same molecule, uh, make that same product now, uh, will, uh, will utilize the knowledge from the previous new drug application about that molecule, about the safety and efficacy. And so they only have to demonstrate two things now from a regulatory standpoint. They have to uh, demonstrate that their active pharmaceutical ingredient is identical uh, to that reference. Um, so, uh, again, uh, it's a small molecule drug, and you can demonstrate that it's identical in terms of the 3D structure. Uh, but also, um, it, there's no safety and efficacy data that's required of the generic, only bioequivalence data. So uh, the bioequivalence data just shows that when um, it's absorbed into the body, uh, that the absorption and the concentration over time 
uh, is uh, essentially the same with the generic as a small molecule drug. Now, for biosimilars and biologics, uh, biologics are approved through the Public Health Service Act uh, and uh, under what's called a biologics license application. And it has, uh, when, when somebody is making a brand new product, uh, that's uh, the the full biologics license application where the full report of safety and efficacy is required. Again, the randomized phase three controlled trials that demonstrate safety and efficacy. So the analogous pathway for the abbreviated new drug application process uh, pathway, uh, the analogous pathway for a biosimilar then becomes one of biosimilarity, the 351K pathway. And to be a biosimilar, again, it doesn't need to demonstrate safety and efficacy again because that's already been demonstrated by the reference. Product. So it, a biosimilar needs to demonstrate two things. Number one, that it's highly similar to the reference product. Not identical, but highly similar. And that's actually okay. High, the term highly similar is an industry standard has, and has been one for about 20 years. And the reason uh, for this terminology is exactly uh, what you described in the previous slide is that uh, these are large, complex, heterogeneous molecules that when you shrink yourself down into the vial of a biologic, you're looking at and, and viewing a molecular population. So there are many different um, uh, structures and, and different uh, uh, like constellation patterns, and, and there's just slight heterogeneity from molecule to molecule within that vial. So it's impossible to have an identical standard, even from lot to lot with the reference product. Uh, so this term highly similar is exactly what the reference product needs to meet. Um, and, uh, and again, this is an industry standard for biologics and has been uh, for a very, very long time. So that's, um, that's the standard uh, for biosimilars, plus it needs to have data showing that there's there's no clinically meaningful differences as well. And so we'll talk about what that data actually is. Now, uh, there's an additional uh, designation, regulatory designation about interchangeability, and uh, we're going to talk about that in, uh, I think, just a little bit. Great. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Ed, can you talk just a little bit about, uh, because this gets at just how complex the uh, manufacturing is for these biologics. Can you talk just a little bit about how the uh, uh, biologics, both whether the originator products or the biosimilars, are manufactured? Uh, because, uh, of course, you have to take the DNA, you have to clone it, ultimately uh, um, put it into a host cell that's going to express uh, the uh, product we're looking for, uh, and then you have to uh, uh, get these cells to expand. You have to purify the proteins. Um, you have to, uh, which involves chromatography and so forth. Can you just walk us through the different steps? Because this is getting at really just how complex the process is uh, in, for making biologics and why the FDA uh, emphasizes um, uh, when we talk about how the process these biosimilars have to go through, why the FDA focuses more heavily on this part than it does on the clinical outcomes because the foundation is that these companies really have to show that uh, their uh, agent uh, is highly biosimilar uh, to the originator compound. And given the complexity of this process, this is what they have to demonstrate to the FDA. Can you talk about this process just a little bit on this slide? Sure, yeah. You know, um, what, what you uh, glean from this process here is that, again, you're having this uh, cell expression system uh, this particular uh, cell over here produce the actual protein that you want. So you need to put um, that DNA into that cell. This is a, a difficult process and, and one that takes a lot of time. These cells are typically Cho cells or Chinese hamster ovary cells or E. coli cells. And uh, once you find a really, really good cell um, that, uh, that, that produces that protein at a high yield with low uh, impurities, uh, then you, you turn that into a bank, right? You save that cell and you bank it and you freeze it, and then each time you make a lot of the, the product, of the drug product, uh, you'll unfreeze a little bit of it and expand that, and that starts the process uh, down here, uh, where essentially it's like going to a microbrewery nowadays where you see those large uh, stainless steel vats uh, and you're growing the cells, um, 
and uh, and they're expanding and they're producing the protein product for you. And uh, you're absolutely right. You have to purify that. You have to uh, uh, filter that uh, to get to the finalized drug product. Now, uh, the important thing is that um, the finalized product is a result of this entire process here. Uh, so the growth media is really important, the pH that you keep it at, the temperature, you know, all of that is really important um, for uh, making the protein and having that protein, uh, the therapeutic protein, fold properly, uh, have the uh, sugar molecules bind properly uh, to, um, to the protein. And so uh, this, uh, any changes that you make in the process can actually cause uh, a, a cha change in the end result, your actual finalized uh, product. Um, and so what typically happens over a, drug, a, a biologics life cycle, cycle is that there are some modifications made to this because of uh, increasing in efficiency in the process, uh, increasing production to scale, to meet demand, uh, those sorts of things. And it's just natural uh, that some of um, these molecules, uh, the finalized products, might look um, a little bit different. We call that a drift, uh, a little bit different uh, compared to previous lots. And, and that happens right now with the reference product. But that's okay because the regulatory authorities, uh, the FDA, uh, the EMA, already have guidance and, and clear guidelines on what to do if that happens and how to mitigate that and manage that. So uh, from the biosimilar standpoint now, uh, it's uh, the biosimilar, what they do is they reverse engineer this process. Uh, they put together a robust process. Uh, they understand what the, the, the target molecule should look like, and they create this, pro uh, um, this process from scratch to actually get you uh, to, to get a product that is uh, highly similar to the reference product, meeting the same uh, standards that uh, the reference product had to meet. Um, so again, if we look at kind of these reference products, there will be variations over time uh, due to the manufacturing process, and that's okay because the reference product has this uh, term that they have to be highly similar to each other uh, from lot to lot, and that doesn't impact safety or efficacy. The FDA already manages, it, manages that through uh, existing guidance. So the biosimilar is not ideal identical to reference, again, because biologics just cannot be identical to each other from lot to lot even. Uh, so we use that same term called highly similar uh, to the reference. Uh, this is not the same thing as being identical because generics can be identical in their uh, structure to small molecule drugs. Um, so, uh, so that's why we keep using that term biosimilar versus generics, um, really to more accurately depict uh, what is going on with the manufacturing of it. Thanks, Ed. The, uh, so, as you talked about from the FDA standpoint, uh, in terms of demonstrating biosimilarity, when a biosimilar is then approved, it has to meet the FDA standard that there be no differences in safety or efficacy. And you know, we're going to talk about that a little bit more coming up. How do we how do we know that? What's demanded of these? Uh, they want to show that the clinical efficacy and safety. Uh, well, first of all, the, the, the Clinical efficacy and safety of the biologic agent, the originator compound, has already been demonstrated. What they're going to look at then is how the biosimilar compound uh, just have to show that it's not significantly different from that reference product. The originator compound, the innovator compound, had already did all the phase three studies, the randomized controlled, uh, randomized, uh, controlled trials, the placebo controlled trials that led to the original approval for the different educations. But the biosimilar compound, once it's demonstrated to the FDA that it's highly similar in its structure, its purity, its immunogenicity, only has to show uh, in uh, basically for one indication that it's not significantly different from the reference product in terms of its uh, clinical efficacy. It doesn't need to replicate uh, in multiple clinical trials in all the indications uh, to show that it's uh, equally uh, efficacious uh, to the originator compound. So that the FDA focuses uh, really on, uh, in terms of showing that it's biosimilar, it's focusing more on the physiochemical and analytical testing. It's going to undergo biological assays to show that the drugs have similar pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. Uh, and then ultimately, there are the clinical studies, but the clinical studies 
are in some ways given less emphasis uh, than um, what the originator compounds went through. In other words, the biosimilars spend more of their time demonstrating to the FDA that the uh, structure, the function of the molecule itself is highly biosimilar to the original compound, uh, and it only is asked to undergo limited clinical studies uh, to uh, satisfy the uh, FDA that the drug has a similar efficacy in at least one of the major indications that the originator drug uh, has. So this is true, as Ed talked about, both with the reference drugs, the originator drugs, that every time they undergo a change in manufacturing, which can happen because these drugs have been on the market for a long time, the technology improves. As the technology improves, they may want to ch changes in their uh, process for manufacturing. And when they make any significant change, uh, they do have to demonstrate to the FDA that that has not changed the uh, structure or function of the drug uh, or the clinical efficacy. So that's true both with, with, with the reference drugs themselves, the innovator drugs themselves, and it's a similar process that the biosimilars have to go through. The focus will be on the physiochemical testing, uh, and there'll only be limited clinical studies that the drug has to go through to satisfy that the drugs uh, work uh, uh, equivalently uh, to the reference product uh, for uh, at least one of the major uh, disease indications. So the process for the reference drugs and the process for biosimilar uh, development are similar. Emphasizing again here this uh, triangle, uh, which is at the, the focus, whether we're talking about uh, uh, in, in the biosimilars uh, or whether we're talking about uh, the originator drugs that have undergone a change in their manufacturing, the focus is on uh, the foundation of this triangle, that is showing that the drugs have similar structure, function, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, the clinical studies that are required by the FDA are limited in nature. You basically are, the drugs are asked to show that there aren't any meaningful clinical differences uh, in at least one of the uh, disease indications, not necessarily all, and we'll get to that in just a second. Um, they really just have to work with the FDA to show that um, uh, uh, they will look at certain populations with certain diseases and show that within that, there are not any clinically meaningful differences. And if I summarize that properly from a pharmacist standpoint, uh, this is different from what we are used to as physicians, where we want randomized uh, controlled trials, placebo-controlled trials, and generally, every time a drug seeks a new indication, they have to go to the FDA and show that in that indication they uh, uh, have uh, uh, placebo-controlled, randomized controlled data showing that the drugs work. Uh, but in the biosimilar, uh, the demands on clinical uh, uh, performance are much more limited in nature. Uh, can we be comfortable with that from a, a clinical standpoint? Is this something that uh, you as a pharmacist feel comfortable with? Is this something we should be comfortable with as physicians that in many cases the uh, uh, sort of expectations for uh, clinical performance are not as rigorous uh, with the biosimilars as they were with the originator compound. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I absolutely feel comfortable because that analytical part of the triangle is the foundation, and uh, and there's really uh, shouldn't be any concern if you uh, do the analytics properly and you see that um, the quality attributes of the protein, uh, kind of those. Uh, uh, specific um, properties of the protein that you pre-identified that if they were different, uh, that would be problematic. But if you see that they're uh, within the same specifications as the reference product, then there's really no no big concern about whether or not that would translate into any clinically meaningful differences. Uh, you still double check, the FDA still makes them, uh, the biosimilar manufacturer double check that with clinical pharmacology studies of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And those additional clinical studies really are there to make us feel better. Uh, the regulators actually say that uh, that's, that's not really the best and sensitive way to detect clinically meaningful differences. Uh, the pharmacokinetic studies really are, uh, but, uh, but they're there actually, uh, again, I think really just to make us as clinicians feel a little bit better, not that, um, 
not that uh, not that that those studies would demonstrate biosimilarity by themselves. So those really are just targeted um, uh, trials in a sensitive population. Yeah. So Ed, maybe as a pharmacist, then uh, you can lead us through the next two slides, which talk about this foundation, and are going to go over the how we know that the structure is the same. Uh, you'll review a little bit with the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, which for many of us who are a bit removed from our pharmacology 101 in medical school, uh, we could benefit from your tutelage in this area. Take us through these next few slides that will show us how we know, how we can reassure our patients that these drugs really are similar in structure and function. Sure. Um, and uh, again, the foundation of that triangle is the structure and function analysis. So uh, again, and again, the foundation, that's in quotes because that's what the regulators say uh, is the foundation of the development uh, and the totality of the evidence. And again, if this is done properly and you see that the molecules or the product specifications are uh, in line with the references specifications, then there really is no need for concern uh, clinically. And uh, what they'll look at are uh, structure and function, so structure being amino acid sequence, uh, what we call higher order structures, so the way that the protein folds, glycosylation patterns, which is uh, how the sugar molecules uh, uh, bind to the proteins, um, and, uh, and pegylation and, and things like that. So again, uh, we're looking at lot to lot, whether or not there's variability from lot to lot, but uh, for, uh, and compare that uh, to the reference product as well. So function, that's uh, your typical pharmacologic studies that are done. And just to give you an example of what this looks like, uh, th this is kind of just a, a, a menu of, of the different things that one would look like to when you're comparing um, a, uh, a biosimilar to the reference product. And they call that a fingerprint because you're looking at specific regions of uh, or attributes of the protein and not the whole protein itself. And so, again, just to give you an example here, for a biosimilar infliximab, uh, looking at the primary amino acid sequence, this is a typical analysis that they do comparing uh, the proposed biosimilar to a U.S. and EU licensed product. And in this particular uh, data here, it shows that the amino acid sequence is the same. Uh, and so when they look at, also look at uh, things like biologic activity, uh, so uh, for infliximab, PNF-alpha binding is important. Uh, you can see that um, the EU and U.S. Remicade is, uh, is, uh, also has this variability. There's a range in the specification from lot to lot. And so the biosimilar falls basically within uh, that same range that uh, the reference has as well. So, uh, so those really help to inform kind of the, the, the bottom part of the, the pyramid. Yeah, can we go back to that previous slide and just uh, talk about this? Because when we see the uh, 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 U.S. Remicade batches, the 27, very tight uh, grouping there with a mean of 99.2 uh, TNF binding affinity. And then you see maybe a little more scatter, probably not what's considered statistically significant, but with perhaps a few of the dots on some of the lots falling below the uh, 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 what are the U.S. Remicade batches? Now, in clinically, as physicians, when we're prescribing these drugs, we are shooting for trough levels where we like to keep them above a certain level, and we'd like to avoid trough levels. Uh, is this a degree of variability in your mind of any concern at all? Would it be nicer if we had a tighter uh, coalescence of the dots? Would it be nicer if we had uh, a really uh, from lot to lot? less variability, or is this just because there are fewer batches, or what's going on here? Because as I look at this, I don't know what to make of this as a uh, physician. I think yeah, you know, it's, um, it, it's, uh, you, you can make almost anything out of, uh, uh, out of, uh, out of this, um, uh, kind of just by, by looking at this. Uh, but uh, you have to remember that uh, this is a very uh, rigorous process that is well-defined early on with a clear statistical analysis. Um, and the FDA actually ha does have guidance um, on kind of the statistical approaches and what really is statistically significantly different in these particular quality attributes. So, um, so if the regulators are okay with this, um, I'm okay with it as well uh, be because we all 
know that uh, you can look at things and um, it can uh, look different, but from a statistical standpoint, there's really no no differences here. So uh, again, this is um, data that the that the regulators looked at and signed off on and said that there were no statistical differences. Great. I so, think, um, from a nursing, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ahead, from a nursing perspective, I think um, slides like the last one sometimes give us caution when we're um, changing our patients over, or it's you know um, even advising a, a biosimilar versus an originator drug. But um, as um, Ed explained, it's a very rigorous process, and I know at first glance some of these. Um, graphs and figures look deceiving or can look like one is not as effective as another, but the process of going through the approval process is what gives us the comfort in moving forward with our patients. Thank you, Kathleen. So, uh, Ed, can you talk about, again, uh, part of this is they have to show they have similar pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and can you just talk briefly about what that means from a, from a clinical standpoint? Yeah, so the pharmacokinetic studies are exactly the same as those bioequivalent studies that the generics have to do, uh, which is looking at concentration over time um, of the uh, of the the product when it's infused into into patients. Or actually, healthy subjects are are actually the most sensitive population there because you don't get um, kind of the disease process interfering with pharmacokinetics. So that's actually the best model to use when looking at. Uh, pharmacokinetics. Uh, they also recommend um, if you have a pharmacodynamic marker. So if you're giving, if you're testing something like insulin, then glucose would be a really fantastic pharmacodynamic marker. Unfortunately, for a lot of monoclonal antibodies, we don't have a good pharmacodynamic marker, so we end up just skipping that uh, type of studies because uh, one wouldn't even exist. And so when you look at uh, this uh, type of study, um, this, and, and this, uh, again, is the most sensitive type of study to pick up any differences. In healthy volunteers, here's uh, an example with a biosimilar adalimumab, and you can see that these, uh, gr these curves are basically superimposed between uh, the biosimilar and the U.S. and the EU uh, references as well. And it's important to note that uh, you'll basically see all of those studies um, done this way with two arms, one with the EU product, uh, one with the U.S. product, because uh, this is what's called a bridging study. In the uh, subsequent clinical trials, they're just going to test the biosimilar against one of these arms, uh, so one of these products, so they have to demonstrate that uh, from a pharmacokinetic standpoint that they're all the same. And uh, we talk a lot about, uh, with biologics, immunogenicity. It's something we've been aware of a long time. All the biologics have a risk of this. Uh, in forming anti-drug antibodies. Uh, this has been particularly true with both uh, adalimumab and infliximab. And this can be a problem for us because it, it can lead to um, uh, problems with infusion reactions. Uh, it can uh, lead to, over time, to loss of uh, efficacy of the drug, although not all these antibodies are neutralizing antibodies. They can be. And actually, there's a lot of concern here uh, with a different manufacturing process with uh, compounds that are biosimilar but not bioidentical, do we know that they will have uh, similar immunogenicity or risk compared to the original uh, uh, biologic agents? Uh, and uh, uh, will antibodies uh, um, uh, formed to one compound cross-react with antibodies that uh, form to another? In other words, if a person had antibodies to the original uh, biosimilar or biologic agent like Remicade, uh, will those antibodies uh, uh, be more likely uh, to, uh, to be cross-react with the uh, biosimilar compound? Can you talk a little bit about these immunogenicity concerns uh, and uh, whether uh, what testing the FDA has gone through with these biosimilars to look at immunogenicity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there are, uh, we, you know, we, we definitely, as you said, know about those clinical consequences that can happen. Um, and uh, there is built into the process 
uh, explicit evaluation of immunogenicity, looking at things like antidrug antibody formation um, when you compare the biosimilar to the reference product, uh, and uh, that will be done in a comparative parallel study uh, type of approach. So actually, all of these studies that we're talking about, the PK studies, uh, essentially every single study in, in human subjects um, will actually have uh, antibody assessments. When you're talking at least about the um, inflammatory, the drugs for inflammatory conditions, uh, they'll just go ahead and measure um, anti-drug antibodies and compare the formation of that with the um, uh, biosimilar versus the reference product. And the assays used for the antibodies uh, with the originator compound, are those the same assays used with the uh, biosimilar compound? And we, do we know that those uh, assays will pick up the antibodies? Uh, will they have the same sensitivity for those antibodies? Uh, as the, uh, in other words, will the assay for one work for the assays for the biosimilars? Yeah, um, you know, essentially, since you're you're picking up the same type of antibody, uh, the same assay would be used, uh, and uh, we I, I don't expect there to be any differences in terms of uh, sensitivity or specificity with uh, uh, when you're when you're testing for antibody development with a biosimilar versus the reference. Okay, so. Once uh, the compounds then have gone through this process, they've shown a similar structure, uh, they've shown uh, similar uh, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics as far as we can test it, and uh, similar degrees of immunogenicity, they will undergo at least some uh, clinical studies to show that they are uh, similar to the reference product, not superior, but also not inferior. Uh, by more than some specified margin as defined by the FDA. And this is, from a clinical standpoint, this is the thing uh, we as nurses, we as physicians, we as pharmacists worry about, just will these drugs work the same in the clinical marketplace? The, uh, as we talked about earlier, the expectations for the drug uh, in this regard uh, is different from the originator drugs when they came out of the market in that uh, there are limited endpoints uh, and limited indications that the biosimilar will be asked to uh, demonstrate uh, uh, similarity and equivalence in. They won't have to demonstrate uh, for every approved indication of the drug necessarily that they are equivalent to the originator compound. Uh, so in the case of infliximab, uh, for example, uh, and, and it really, in the case of several of the biologics uh, uh, that are approved for uh, IBD, uh, the, uh, since these biologics are often approved in rheumatoid arthritis, which is an easier disease to study, uh, they have uh, sometimes undergone more clinical testing for uh, rheumatoid arthritis to show their bioequivalent. Uh, and from that, there is an extrapolation that's made to other approved indications such as IBD. So, for example, this was a study done um, in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it was a, a randomized, uh, double-blind study comparing the originator uh, uh, infliximab, or Remicade, to the uh, biosimilar uh, infliximab, and looking at the ACR20, uh, but also the ACR50 and 70, uh, and comparing them over a 30-week uh, time point and not finding any uh, significant difference, treatment difference in the outcome with the biosimilar compound and the originator compound, the biosimilar compound in this case having a 1.88% uh, uh, difference compared to the uh, originator compound. So from this, the uh, 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 company then um, seeks to uh, 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 extrapolate that experience to other uh, uh, diseases for which the originator compounds had approval uh, and has asked to undergo uh, more limited uh, clinical trials uh, showing uh, equivalence in order to have approval uh, for those indications. And Ed, are you able to talk about um, the comfort, again, that we should have in this regard as clinicians, 
Uh, yeah, you or, know, this is um, what they call scientific justification. It's not a rubber stamp. The company has to justify with data and evidence that uh, you can extend the conclusion from that one clinical study to the other populations, and it's based off of looking at what you know about the biosimilar totality of the evidence, that pyramid that we talked about, uh, what you know about the reference product and the differences in uh, the disease factors of mechanism of action, uh, pharmacokinetics, biodistribution, immunogenicity, and toxicity, uh, what you know about the differences of uh, between the different indications for the reference product in those domains, um, and then you kind of just ask yourself, are there any expectations or differences across the populations that would be of concern given what we know about the reference product and the biosimilar? And, uh, and really the bottom line is that if um, when you look at the uh, analytical studies of structure and function, if those are really clean and uh, highly similar without any flaws in them, and, uh, and really you know exactly how the reference drugs works and it's characterized very well, there really isn't any reason uh, to believe that, it would wor that the biosimilar would work any differently in the other indications than uh, the, the reference product. Great. Thank you. So, uh, Ed, and, and I'll bring in Kathleen on this too, uh, the issue is uh, uh, interchangeability. That is, uh, and I want you to talk about this a little bit because this is uh, something that physicians and nurses and patients will be concerned about, that if they're on one compound and doing well, they're, let's say they're on the originator infliximab compound, can the a company or a pharmacist on their own change to the biosimilar compound without their approval or uh, without their knowledge or without the physician's approval and knowledge this is what I believe is called interchangeability and it is a higher hurdle that the company has to uh, surmount in order to have the designation of interchangeable. Uh, can you talk about that and whether any of the current biosimilars have the designation of interchangeable? Yeah, you know, interchangeability, we have to remember, is a regulatory designation. It has nothing to do with the quality of the product uh, itself. And the higher hurdle really is um, the fact that they have to do this, what's called a dedicated switching study, to achieve that regulatory designation. Um, and, uh, and so uh, the, the purpose of this would... Uh, allow an interchangeable biosimilar to behave like a generic in practice where uh, someone like myself, a pharmacist, would be able then to substitute an interchangeable biosimilar for the reference product. Um, and, and the number of state laws actually allow for this uh, to happen. The problem is we don't have any interchangeable biosimilars because the FDA just released uh, their guidance on how to do that earlier this year, and so nobody really prepared uh, to do those types of switching studies because they didn't know they had to do them. And, um, and this is uh, Kathleen again. Um, can you just walk us through? This happens in the hospital setting as well. There has to be a, a, pharmaco, a pharmacy and therapeutics committee that approves the therapeutic substitution of a drug before a patient can be changed. So if you had a patient in the hospital, they would do their dose for their infliximab. Um, a process would have hopefully already been gone through in the hospital to establish how they would handle that. Yeah, so um, because there aren't any interchangeable biosimilars right now, uh, we, uh, the, the hospitals and health systems will use the formulary process, the P&T committee, to enact what's called a therapeutic interchange. So um, uh, the uh, doctors and the pharmacists and the nurses will review all the data and basically say, is it okay to switch patients from uh, one product to another? Uh, and um, and if so, then the pharmacist independently, you know, will uh, just go ahead and uh, and do that switch. But that's limited to a um, uh, a health system um, uh, uh, approach if if the uh, if the health system goes ahead and makes that determination uh, based off the PNT committee. And uh, what we have here on this slide is pharmacist substitution, meaning that uh, so this is kind of the traditional. Uh, type of dispensing in community pharmacies, but also specialty pharmacies with uh, products like uh, self-injectable uh, products like adalimumab. Um, you know, that if we did have an interchangeable adalimumab, then uh, it's possible that the pharmacist would be able to dispense uh, that product in place of the reference or, or substitute that in place of the reference. 
Um, but And the framework for doing that it follows exactly uh, the same as generic laws in that uh, – uh, that there would be provisions for uh, being able to write dispense as written, communicating that switch, uh, that substitution with the provider um, and the and the patient, and having to have some some record keeping with that. But right now, Ed, none of the uh, uh, given the current FDA regulations and the requirements for demonstrating interchangeability, uh, none of the currently approved biosimilars in the IBD space are listed as interchangeable. So it's my understanding would be that a particular for outpatients, if they're on a, uh, uh, the, one of the originator drugs and doing well, uh, a formulary cannot routinely switch them to a biosimilar without at least bringing that to their attention and the physician's attention and getting their approval at this time. Is that correct? They might have to pay a higher copay, but they can't be switched um, by the pharmacist or the, or the formulary plan. Without, yeah, I, I would have to if the if the um, payer is saying that uh, I need to dispense the biosimilar, uh, then I need to call somebody to get a new prescription to do that. I'm not allowed to just uh, go ahead and do that myself. Right. Okay. Uh, the uh, so let's uh, uh, I'd like to turn this over to Kathleen since patients are going to have a lot of questions. Kathleen, do you want to bring us home here with what? Yeah. How do you educate um, patients about this and what the key messages should be? Absolutely. So um, all this education we received today on the FDA process and um, how biosimilars are made, manufactured, approved, um, leads us to um, patient education. And uh, what us as nurses and physicians and even pharmacists will encounter are patient questions and concerns, and we need to be able to answer those with confidence and allay any fears that they may have. Um, so. Uh, We'll be, um, you need to be able to address questions and concerns, um, answer their fears. New patients will need reassurance about biosimilars and their effectiveness, and we've learned those things today. Um, patients who are on a reference product and possibly their insurance is wanting them to switch to a different product, um, to a uh, biosimilar product, we need to be able to educate them on the on the process of the approval of the biosimilar product, make sure they're comfortable with it, and if not, reassure them that they don't have to switch. There are options for them. Um, I think it's important to be able to support patients, um, inform them, make sure they're able to make good decisions and have the information they need to make those decisions. Um, for nurses that administer biosimilars, they are, they are administered as the same way as the reference product. They may come in different packaging or a different delivery device, but um, they are delivered the same way. A reference product for infliximab, um, the reference infliximab and the biosimilar are both delivered by the um, same dosing recommendations, same um, uh, drug uh, monitoring testing is done, and the same with um, at Alitimab products, those are injections. You'll teach the patient the same, although the delivery device may be different. So it's important um, to feel confident about how you're speaking with the patient, um, reassuring them that the monitoring the same, the delivery is the same, and the results, um, the end results should be the same. Um, we can move on to the key messages. Um, biologics, including biosimilars, are complex drugs that cannot be made generic. And that's important to know. Um, we need to be able to know that if they're switching um, and what state laws are different, but currently there are no interchangeable drugs. And um, that if, if a pharmacy is wanting to switch or insurance is wanting to switch, that that would require a new prescription. Um, and those calls may be coming into the physician practice and they may come to the nurse. The comparability exercise used to demonstrate that a boss similar is highly similar to reference uh, product is scientific, scientific, robust, and regulated. I think we have been presented enough information here today to be assured that um, we should have the same efficacy, whether the patient's on a biosimilar or a reference product. Um, an approved biosimilar can be expected to have the same efficacy, as I just stated, and safety profile. If a patient's having a reaction on a reference product, we would not switch them to a biosimilar of the same product. We would expect they would have the same reaction. Um, based on the totality of evidence, biosimilars can be approved to treat indications even without clinical trials in that indication. 
So it's, it, we need to be reassured that um, the process is robust, but not necessarily a clinical trial or a randomized control trial has to be done to prove that. Interchangeability is an FDA designation beyond the biosimilar and requires additional data, and currently none of the um, biosimilars that are in the um, IBD realm are approved for interchangeability. And the availability of biosimilars has the potential to broaden patient access to biologic therapies and reduce healthcare costs. And ultimately, access to healthcare and reducing costs are goals of all of us. So, um, Thank as you, Jeff. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, oh, Dr. McClain. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, so our patient we presented earlier had IBD questions. She's um, questions about her treatment. She's 27 years of age. She's diagnosed with moderate to severe ulcerative colitis. She um, has had mental pool improvement on her current treatment plan. And after discussion, the decision is made to start an anti-TNF agent and fliximab. So um, we'll continue. Uh, how would we answer her questions? I think we've learned a lot of those questions today. We could put her on the, rep the biosimilar product as well as the reference product. We have the answers to um, reassure her um, that the therapy should be as effective and may cost less and um, all the in, in, uh, administration is the same and the uh, drug monitoring will be the same as the reference product would have been. Um, we'll continue with part two. Oh, go ahead, Dr. McQuaid. Oh, yeah, no, so in part two, we're, we're going to actually probe this a little bit more in there for the people that are on this. We'd love if you join it because we actually are going to then get into the case scenarios you're like to, likely to see. Uh, you know, is it safe to switch a patient who's doing well on a brand name biologic to the biosimilar compound uh, for cost reasons, for example? Uh, if the patient is doing well on the reference product, uh, is it uh, reasonable to, or isn't doing well on the reference product, would we have any reason to want to switch them to the biosimilar? And uh, how will a biosimilar be different and then starting your patient the reference product. And we'll go over those uh, in the upcoming uh, scenarios uh, uh, in November. Um, I would like to open it up to Q&A. Uh, and actually, I'm going to, the first question that was out there uh, was uh, directed for you, Ed. Um, and the question is, when we talk about the biosimilars and the fact that uh, as uh, the, the sort of how difficult it is to produce both the, the originator compounds, the biologics, and the biosimilar. Does this mean that from batch to batch, uh, uh, as these things are made, that there is some, uh, are they slightly different? Could the molecules be slightly different or the concentration be slightly different based on that particular uh, process at that time, that culture, that purification process? Um, the uh, sort of medium that it's put into, how much variability do you think there sort of is from batch to batch to batch, either with the biosimilars or the biologic agents? Yeah, so um, that's a really great question. Uh, it's important to note that it's not the concentration of the drug or uh, kind of the, the dose of the drug that changes from batch to batch, uh, but some of those kind of molecular features, uh, perhaps the, the uh, glycosylation patterns or... Um, you know, uh, slight slight differences and things like uh, impurities and things like that that may be different from batch to batch. But we have to remember this is true for every manufactured pharmaceutical product, whether or not you're talking about generic small molecule drugs uh, or reference biologics or biosimilars as well. Every single manufactured drug product um, has some differences from lot to lot, uh, and um, and that is okay because that is heavily heavily regulated by the regulatory authority. Uh, they ha have to constantly take samples and, and, and look at where um, each batch is in, uh, in context of, uh, of, uh, of, of the, the reference ranges in terms of where they're allowed to be. So uh, these are heavily regulated products. Yes, there will be some inherent batch-to-batch -batch variability, but that's okay. It's heavily regulated. It's heavily managed. Thank you very much. So this takes us uh, to the end of this evening's uh, first webinar. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, concern out, out there, a lot of anxiety among patients, among physicians, among nurses. Uh, we can't uh, uh, pretend that we've answered 
uh, all of the concerns people might have, but we hope that uh, you come away with a little bit more information about how uh, carefully regulated the uh, process is uh, by the FDA in terms of assuring that these compounds are as biosimilar uh, in structure, in function, in pharmacokinetics, pharmacogenomics, and clinical efficacy as we can reasonably demand. Uh, and of course, uh, the companies are being asked to continue to monitor um, these uh, drugs now that they're on the marketplace uh, to look at uh, efficacy, imagedicity, and so forth over time. Uh, these drugs will be here. You're going to be seeing them. We hope we've given you a little more uh, uh, knowledge uh, to provide to your patients uh, and a little more reassurance uh, that uh, patients are not receiving an inferior compound, but a biosimilar compound. Uh, and we look forward to talking to you again in November when we will probe into more clinical scenarios that you may face uh, in the use of these, excuse me, in the use of these compounds. Uh, thank you. I want to thank uh, Kathleen and Ed for uh, participating this evening. And uh, we will stay on for a few more minutes. If you have any other questions that you'd like to submit, uh, you can do that either by phone uh, or by queuing up your question there in the Q&A panel there uh, and uh, uh, pressing uh, star and pound. And we'll wait for a few more minutes to see if anybody else has anything else to say. And Ed or Kathleen, if you'd like to make any closing comments, please do. Yeah, you know, I think you've um, put it uh, very, very nice and succinctly that uh, these are heavily regulated products. Um, the regulatory authorities um, have very, very, very strict um, uh, requirements for uh, approval of these products. And, and I think you see uh, how strict it is by uh, the fact that many um, proposed biosimilars uh, actually um, ha have been held up because there were some issues that the FDA identified. So, um, so the companies are working to address those before it actually gets approved. So, um, uh, that that makes me feel very comfortable about these products. I'd like to thank well, all the thank nurses. You. Oh. Go ahead, Kathleen, please. Yeah, hey, I'd like to thank all the nurses in the audience today, and. Um, uh, you know, you're never going to know what situation you're in when a patient may ask you a question about um, their medication or uh, their treatment plan. Um, and so I just um, I appreciate everyone listening in and learning the FDA process and being aware of, of how things happen and move along in the process so that we can inform our patients to make better decisions and informed decisions about their health care. And um, and hopefully, uh, in the next scenario, we'll learn all the clinical applications and um, how we can put these put this into action and give our patients uh, the treatment they need. Thank you. Well, it looks like we don't have any other questions submitted. So with that, I will thank everybody and wish you all a good evening. <laughs>